This is part two of the lecture on temporal bone anatomy. We're going to continue moving medially now and get into the inner ear, the otic capsule. The otic capsule is the hardest bone in the body. That's why we call this the petrous or hard portion of the temporal bone. We distinguish between the otic capsule, which is something that we evaluate on CT, and the membranous labyrinth, which are the membranes separating the different fluid-containing structures within the inner ear. When we are looking at an MRI, we talk about the membranous labyrinth. When we are looking at a CT, we talk about the otic capsule. The otic capsule contains within it the cochlea, which is that spiral structure spinning up that contains all the hair cells that uh, provide hearing. The vestibule, which is more posterior and is responsible for balance. The semicircular canals that come off of the vestibule. And the uh, fallopian canal, which is what we call the bony canal that contains the petrous segments of the facial nerve. When we look at the otic capsule, when we evaluate the otic capsule, there are a couple of important reference points. On axial images, you can't catch the whole cochlea at once. So you've got to have a couple of different reference points, and thankfully they all have food analogies. If you find yourself looking at a banana, uh, frankly it looks more like a gherkin to me, but it's supposed to look like a banana, that's the basal turn of the cochlea. If we go up a cut, we'll find ourselves looking at a stack of pancakes, sometimes called a stack of coins. That stack of pancakes is the portion of the, of the, of the basal turn of the cochlea, and now you can see the upper turns coming in. Notice on this image, you can see the round window. If you come around back here into the round window niche, there's the round window as seen on the axial plane. And if we continue up another cut, we find ourselves leaving the basal turn of the cochlea behind. Now all we're seeing are the upper turns of the cochlea with the bony scala separating them, and this has been likened to a bunch of cherries. While we're here in the otic capsule, we also want to look at the fallopian canal. We'll start with the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve that swings forward in a graceful arc from the anterior aspect of the internal auditory canal, swings forward until it hits the geniculate ganglion of the facial nerve. It turns around, makes a U-turn, comes back along the medial aspect of the tympanic cavity as the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. It gets all the way to the back of the tympanic cavity, makes a right turn straight up and down, and then we call it the mastoid or vertical segment of the facial nerve, which on axial images gets cut in cross-section and just looks like a circle. Another important reference point for us in the coronal plane now is the snail. So here's a coronal cut, and you can really see the layout of the cochlea a little more clearly. You get a sense of its spiral nature more clearly when you cut in the coronal plane. But that's not all that makes us think of a snail. Sure, this makes us think of the snail shell, but you can also see two snail's eyes above the, above the shell. What are those eyes? Those are the labyrinthine and tympanic portions of the facial nerve cut in cross section. The labyrinthine swinging forward, the tympanic coming back along the medial aspect of the middle ear cavity. So our snail here is the cochlea and two segments of the facial nerve. The stylomastoid foramen is the continuation of the mastoid portion of the facial nerve, and here it is coming straight down and opening out into the parotid gland. While we're here on this image, it's worth talking about the jugular bulb. The jugular bulb lives just medial to the stylomastoid foramen right here. The carotid canal runs through the medial aspect of the petrous bone. It is often surrounded by pneumatized air cells, and it has a predictable caliber. If we follow that down more inferiorly, we'll see the carotid foramen through which the carotid artery enters the skull. 
Here's the style of mastoid foramen, again found in cross section now, uh, emerging out. This is going to become the styloid process here, and here are the mastoid air cells. That's why this is called the style of mastoid foramen. It's easiest to find if you just follow the mastoid segment of the facial nerve down until it emerges out the bottom of the skull. The hypoglossal canal, another important reference point for us, it runs at about 45 degrees, just lateral to the clivus. And it, of course, carries the hypoglossal nerve, as well as a small remnant of the fetal hypoglossal artery. So we've gone through the skull base, but let's take a moment now to review all the holes in the head that we can see on this single axial cut. We just talked about this, it's the jugular bulb. Just anterior to that is the carotid foramen. But what about this triangular foramen medially, just out to the side of the clivus? It's got irregular boundaries and is triangular in shape. This is foramen lacerum. Now these next two foramina this oval one here and the round one just posterior lateral to it um, are often taken together. This is foramen ovale and this is its partner foramen spinosum. Foramen ovale uh, conveys the third branch of the fifth cranial nerves. Foramen spinosum conveys the middle meningeal artery. The two of them together have been likened to the imprint of, the, of a high-heeled shoe. So if you can find a high-heeled shoe, you know you're looking at those two foramina. Moving forward, this is foramen rotundum as seen along its length. It doesn't look very round because you're seeing it along its length rather than in cross-section. And if we take that further forward, we find ourselves looking at the inferior orbital fissure. All of these foramina, of course, visible in the coronal plane as well, but one worth emphasizing, this is what foramen ovale looks like in the coronal plane. It's got this 45 degree slope out laterally as it descends through the skull base, a really important landmark for perineural spread. We're going to continue on medially now and talk about the internal auditory canal. The IAC is a tapered cylinder that extends from the porous acousticus, this opening here, to the fundus, this dead end there. Those are the two ends of the internal auditory canal. It, of course, conveys multiple branches of the seventh and eighth cranial nerves. One other object really worth pointing out because it is frequently mistaken for an abnormal mass in the cerebellum pontine angle cistern, and that is the flocculus of the cerebellum. If you see a mass-like structure just behind the porous acousticus, think for a moment and make sure that it's not just the normal flocculus of the cerebellum. So in closing, I want to remind you to take a systematic approach when you evaluate CT of the temporal bone. Um, you can take any pattern you like. I happen to like outside to in, external uh, canal, middle ear, mastoids, inner ear, internal auditory canal, cerebellar pointing angle to brainstem. But don't forget to also look at some of our special anatomic structures in the temporal bone, the carotid artery, the jugular bulb, and the facial nerve. This ends the lecture on temporal bone anatomy. You're all set for the series of lectures on temporal bone pathology.